Good morning. This is Pastor Rick, and this is our lectionary Bible study for Thursday, July 16th, and it's for the Sunday service, the seventh uh, Sunday after Pentecost. I'm glad you could join us. We have three marvelous texts this morning uh, from Isaiah, from Romans, and from Matthew. And we'd like to start in uh, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 44. On Sunday, we're going to be reading 7 to 8, uh, but I would like to add a little bit uh, to that. Uh, I'm going to start with verse 1. But before I do, please join me in, in prayer. Uh, good and gracious God, for all your gifts to us, we give you thanks, but particularly for your word. And we pray that you would speak to us, not just on Sunday, but now as we delve into your word, uh, bless our hearing through the gift of your Holy Spirit. And we all say to that, amen and amen. All right, I think now we're ready. So Isaiah 44, again on Sunday, it'll be just six to eight, but I think we have to start with verse one here to get the whole full force of the poetry, because this is part of a poem. You can look in your Bible and you can tell when, uh, like in Isaiah, whether the form is poetry, because you'll see it indented differently than prose, like uh, Isaiah 44, verse 9. He goes into a very different type of speech. So, verse 1. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen, thus says the Lord, who made you, who formed you in the womb and will help you. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurim, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. They shall spring up like a green tamarisk, like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call by the name of Jacob. Yet another will write on the hand, the Lord's, and adopt the name of Israel. Now here comes the reading for Sunday. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God who is like me. Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from of all the things are to come? Let them tell us what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock. I know not one. Oh, this is a powerful text from, you remember this is second Isaiah. What we mean by second Isaiah is uh, the children of Israel now are already in exile. And so he's writing a word of comfort to those who are in Babylon. And when we know that, that uh, the audience is in exile, that their homeland has been destroyed, their temple has been destroyed, therefore their, their way of worship has been obliterated. They're living in a foreign land, they're serving other people. Having said all that, this text just explodes with meaning. And I think what we need to focus on here are the names of God. Because once again, uh, Isaiah is speaking a word of comfort to those in exile. And so the words he uses, first of all, is thus says the Lord. We tend to skip over that and think more about Roman times, New Testament times. But this is still uh, Old Testament. And the Lord here is Yahweh, uh, this uh, word that couldn't even be pronounced, the Y-H-W-H. Um, so this is a very special designation for God that is holy, was even supposed to be unspoken. Um, and this is once again a reminder of the whole history of Israel. So when uh, the writer says, thus says the Lord, all right, we remember. This is the one that was lifted up and called Abraham, the whole history through Moses and the establishment of the kingdom, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, David. I mean, every, all the whole history of Israel is tied up with this word. But then he goes on, the king of Israel. That's a 
interesting naming of God here because at this time they're in exile, right? They have no functioning king. And so here Isaiah is reminding them that their true king is the Lord. And uh, this is a powerful reminder, takes us back to Samuel, you know, when the people said, we want a king, and Samuel said, I don't think you want a king, uh, because he'll, he'll tax you and he'll send you to war. They said, no, we want a king, we want someone to defend us. And so here, again, while they don't have a functioning king, God says, uh, 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 Isaiah says, the Lord is your king. And then Redeemer. Uh, we've lost some of this tradition, although we... we Rehearse it sometimes when, uh, for example, in other countries, in Iran, when they take hostages, we expect our government to redeem, to bring back one way or another uh, our people. And this was standard procedure uh, up until modern times, like in Luther's time, uh, often people would uh, take people hostage right? The travelers are along the road, especially wealthy people, and then they expect the prince to come and redeem them, to purchase them back. And this is what Isaiah is talking about. Here's the God who will redeem, who will purchase back his people then out of exile. And then he says, the Lord of hosts. Now notice this is all in verse 6, this string of titles for God. The Lord of hosts is a military term. So we would say, uh, we might say something like, oh, the Lord of battalions, uh, which is a fascinating description for those who are in Israel. Excuse me, those in Israel who are in Babylon, because they're watching one of the most powerful empires in the world. And here amidst the power of Babylon, Isaiah is saying, but our God is the Lord of hosts. The Lord of all the heavenly armies is really the one who is in control. And of course, then we have, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. <clears throat> Here, the temptation for Israel uh, was to say, now we're living in Babylon. And are their gods more powerful than the Lord? Because obviously they won the battle. They are uh, the strongest empire known. They have destroyed us. They brought us into exile. So are their gods not more powerful than our God? And here Isaiah is reminding them, no, God of hosts, God of the battalions, the first and the last, there is no other God. Even these gods that you're seeing on the streets where they're acknowledging uh, that, that have all these witnesses and statues and temples in Babylon, they really don't exist. This is quite a powerful statement because other places in the Old Testament, God is not seen as the only God, but just the superior God, right? Uh, there are other gods out there, but God is superior. And here, wow, Isaiah is something, saying something much more profound that all these other gods actually do not exist. Only the God of Israel uh, exists. Not just the supreme God, the only God. Oh my goodness, a lot going on then in this text with the names of God, Isaiah speaking to those who are in exile, who are at their weakest point. It's a very, very powerful text. By the way, uh, Martin Luther's favorite uh, designation for God was Redeemer. He took that uh, uh, not just from here, but from other places like in Job uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, take a look at his catechism, especially the second article of the Apostles' Creed. This is the phrase he loved to use. All right, uh, we now want to move to Romans. Uh, and this passage is one that has directed so many prayer warriors. And I mean that people who are committed to pray on a regular basis, and they often turn to this text in Romans. It's Romans 8, 12, uh, through 25. And when I read it, remember that in Romans, Paul has already laid out the argument uh, that we were captive to sin. Jesus comes in and frees us from sin. Now there is now no condemnation. And so the question is, well, then how do we live? And now Paul's going to give the answer. We're going to live in the spirit. So 12 to 25, Paul writes, so then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. 
For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, is it that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are indeed children of God? And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? If we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Okay, the context for our first reading from Isaiah was Babylon. And the second, of course, is Rome. As Paul is writing uh, to this congregation in Rome, these powerful words of how to now live uh, with our faith in Jesus Christ. And he's describing this, making a comparison between life in the spirit and life in the flesh. And there he says, did you notice that, that we're giving up some of the old behaviors of the body, and now we're living um, with the spirit inside us. And the first thing the spirit does, what is it? It cries, Abba, Father. So the spirit is in us saying, God is our father. In fact, the Abba, we remember, is the, uh, that lovely phrase that children use, Daddy. And I'm always struck when adults go home and they see their parents and these adults are also retired you know they're 60 70 years old and they see their parents and and yet you still see your mom and your dad you say mommy or daddy i mean it's such a child like phrase so that when we use it as adults i i've always found that very touching well that's the spirit at least of this text where we as adults still approach God and we say our father, our daddy, and that's because the spirit gives us confidence uh, that that's the relationship we have. Uh, so <clears throat> it's interesting, you'll notice here, it's not just talking about us as individuals, it's not even just talking about us as a community, as a Christian community, but the whole creation is like it's pulling for us. The whole creation is waiting for our liberation so that it might also be set free. This is, for anyone who really likes creation care, uh, who's committed to this, figuring out what's God doing in the world, this is a powerful text because the Spirit is not just trying to save individuals or save individual souls. It's trying to liberate all of creation. and Our liberation of the people of God uh, has to come first. Uh, notice, too, a last comment that the, the, the role the Spirit played in the Isaiah in those first verses, that God was going to pour out God's Spirit on all flesh. Here, again, Paul talks about this very same vision of God pouring out God's Spirit on all flesh because of the act of Jesus. All right, so we move from Babylon. We, we move then to Rome. And now we're going to move into a garden. And I might even say the Garden of Eden, although that's not like the picture behind me, but that's where this text of, actually the two parables from Matthew 13, where they start, is they start with this image of God being the good gardener, right? And in the parable from last week that Pastor Steve preached, you notice it was uh, the good gardener throwing seed and throwing seed everywhere, not just on the good soil, uh, but on the hard soil, on the rocks, you know, in the thistles. And so um, what the disciples found confusing about that parable is going to be reflected in the parable this week as well, because they're saying, okay, we've got God as a good gardener, right? But the good gardener, it is a sense, a non-effective gardener. You might say as a poor gardener or as a bad gardener, because no good gardener would just 
waste seed on non-productive ground. And so the disciples are curious about what's going on with this parable. And then these ineffective farming techniques are continued this week in the parable of the um, weeds, the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds. Here, once again, the good gardener, thinking again of God being in the Garden of Eden, inviting Adam and Eve uh, to work in the garden, now inviting us also to participate in God's world, in God's garden, asks us to really practice some bad farming techniques. And, and this week, the bad farming technique is not hoeing, and not taking out the weeds. And the disciples heard this and, and said, well, you know, you just told a parable where the servants really needed to go out and hoe and get rid of the weeds so that there'd be more fruit, right? So that the wheat would grow straight and true. And here Jesus says, no, I want you to sow and to produce fruit, and I don't want the church to weed. Uh, and again, the disciples are confused by that, as, as we are too. Any of you uh, who are used to gardening know you got a weed, right? It's good for the final crop. And here Jesus says, well, first of all, the weeds just didn't happen. Uh, the evil one, Satan, has come in, in the night and planted bad seed. The servants go, okay, but let's then hoe it. And God says, no, I don't want you to focus on that because I'm afraid you're going to pull up the wheat. In other words, I'm so committed to the fruit, to the wheat growing, I'm afraid if you judge hoe, then you will also be judged. You'll ruin your own wheat. In other words, he says, wait until the angels will do this sort of parsing, this judging at the end of time. Uh, right now, I'm afraid if the church focuses on weeding, taking out those who don't belong, taking out those who doubt, taking out those who might be sinners, that the church will actually hurt the work of the kingdom that God is trying to do in our midst. So I think that this is really important, this uh, text, and so we have the back drop here of the garden because God has invited the church into this work and the emphasis is on go out and seed, produce fruit, don't weed. And we're going to talk Sunday a little bit about the nature of allegory and parable and fable because I think that helps us see the move Jesus is moving here from allegory to parable, but a parable that's not just a moral lesson, but a spiritual one about God. And I hope that this would give us comfort on this um, Thursday to think that, you know, sometimes I might worry that because of my sin and my failure, that I'm not up to God's task, that God might weed me, right? That people might focus on me and take me out, <laughs> uh, right? Don't we all fear that, that uh, if people just knew the way we really thought and, and knew some of our behaviors, right? Uh, well, in a weeding process, uh, we might not you know, make the grade. And therefore, we have a gracious God. Even though our hearts are hard at times and are bad soil, God still plants in our heart. God still wants fruit to grow in our heart, even though we have thistles. And here, even though we've got sin and foibles in the church or in our own lives, huh, God says, let the fruit continue to grow. Don't weed. And it's interesting that this uh, text is in Matthew because at the beginning in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, judge not lest you, lest you be judged. And at the end, when he gathers his disciples on the mountain, he said, some worshiped him and others doubted. Even John the Baptist, just a few chapters before, came to Jesus or sent uh, his messengers and said, are you the one? I mean, even John the Baptist had his doubts and therefore Jesus comes with this word of grace, seed, don't weed as the church. <laughs> so we've got these three great texts. I hope you'll also watch the uh, Sunday Forum where we talk a little bit about more about uh, allegory and parable and what kind of parable we have here. It's more than a morality lesson. It's saying something about God 
which is why it's uh, harder to understand and much more interesting. So uh, thanks for joining us, and I hope uh, this evening you'll also join us for a happy hour at Emmanuel at 5 o'clock. It's a great time of fellowship. Uh, blessings to you uh, this week and on Sunday as, again, we go deeper in God's word. Bye-bye now.